Welcome, everybody. Hello, my name is Barry Taylor from Equip for Quality, and uh, welcome to those of you who are in the room and also those of you who are watching on the webinar. Uh, today, we have a very interesting topic, something we've never focused on before, uh, called Trauma uh, Informed Advocacy. And uh, we have Sarah Hess here from the Legal Council for Health Justice. Uh, some folks may have known that before as AIDS Legal Council, and they've transformed and expanded their mission and are doing some excellent work. Um, and Sarah's been uh, at the Legal Council for a while, and before that, she was at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, this is Skadden Fellow. And uh, this is a topic that I think uh, is one that is very helpful both as we serve clients, but also as we take care of ourselves while we serve our clients. And so um, we're really excited for all of you to be here to listen to this. And just a reminder, uh, those of you who are interested in um, professional responsibility credit, we're going to be applying for that for lawyers. Um, we'll definitely get CLE credit, 1.5 hours, but hopefully we'll be approved for professional responsibility credit. I think this topic certainly uh, falls within those guidelines. For those of you who are watching the webinar, the way for you to do that is just to send me an email after the session is over at barryt at equipforequality.org and uh, confirm that you watch the whole thing. And uh, those of you who are in the room, make sure you sign in, and uh, then we'll follow up with you with your certificate once we get approval from uh, the MCLE board. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks, Barry. And so we're talking about trauma-informed advocacy. I'm really going to try to get to the practical tools and really talk through those today. Um, so forgive me, we're going to kind of tear through the first part. Um, I'm doing two things with two hands, so I, we're going to see how it goes. Um, so today we're going to talk about an overview of trauma and symptoms. Uh, we're going to get into practical tools and we're going to do a short role play. Don't worry, I'm not going to call on you. Um, and then we are going to talk about secondary trauma in the helping professions um, and talk about some tools for self-care. Um, so first, uh, I just wanted to see from folks in the room who is familiar with the ACEs study already. Okay, great. All right, so we will we'll get everybody up to speed. Um, to, there it goes. Okay. No, didn't do it. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start with ACEs. Um, I don't know if this is a tease or if I'm going to spare you, but the epigenetics and the hard science and the really super science is not going to be um, a large portion of today's presentation. Uh, but first, I just wanted to ground this um, in the trauma-informed practices that are happening nationally. So there is a movement happening. Um, even SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, has put out guidelines on how to be a trauma-informed practice or organization. Um, so first, it's just understanding trauma and its widespread um, presence in our populations, uh, recognizing the signs and symptoms in our clients. That one did it, this one didn't. Okay. Um, and then trying to really integrate that knowledge into not only our direct services, but also our organizational policies and procedures. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to resist re-traumatization. Uh, so those are sort of the bare bones. Um, and then just to, to sort of give you the, the context, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is very helpful for resources as you delve into this stuff. Um, but here in Illinois, we have a pretty robust um, set of folks working on ACEs and trauma. So the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative, the Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition has tons of great resources. Uh, the Center for Childhood Resilience at Lurie is doing some really great work. And you'll see resources from each of these groups through the slides today. Uh, so first, I just want to, I'm going to harp on this a little bit, um, but as we delve into ACEs and trauma. You mentioned the word, is it an acronym or a word, ACEs? It is an acronym, sorry. It's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and I'm about to give you all of the background on that. Um, uh, but essentially, as we talk about adverse childhood experiences, the most important thing to remember and take away um, is that we're talking about risk factors. We're not talking about things that are a certainty. We're not talking about um, outcomes that are guaranteed, right? This is a population health. This is a higher level look um, at, at people's experiences and those experiences impact on health outcomes. 
Um, so it doesn't mean that as I talk to an individual, I can predict their future, right? We're just talking very high level. Um, but the reason that's useful is because as you provide these services to your clients, keeping that lens is going to help every client, whether they've experienced adverse childhood experiences, trauma in their past, or not. So let's go to, I'm going to give you a short video. Um, and the, or where is the video? I got it here. Uh, and this is from KPGR Films, and they did a fantastic film called Paper Tigers. It's a documentary on a high school in Walla Walla, Washington, um, that has adopted a trauma-informed approach. This is going to give you the basics of the Adverse Childhood Experiences study um, and what came out of it. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development, as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle class and college educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, 
and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. Uh, so you can tell they say that better than I do. Um, uh, but I do recommend Paper Tigers as well as a film. It talks about the educational viewpoint um, on ACEs and trauma. Um, and what we found um, here we go um, is that identifying adverse childhood experiences and early childhood trauma. Um, then leads or can lead to um, neurodevelopmental and epigenetic influences, social, emotional, and cognitive functioning, risky behaviors, um, disease, disability, social problems, right? All of these things uh, have, have a direct uh, dose response. So the higher the number of ACEs, the higher number of issues, whether social or health. Um, and I'm just going to run through a couple of these to give you here a sense of, so it's not just risky behaviors that come out of this. Um, there's actually also a lot of research on different diseases that are correlated to adverse childhood experiences. Um, and then having those experiences can have an effect on adult life, which can then be transmitted to the next generation um, through environment, through different um, issues in the home. I should mention the ACEs study focused on the home simply because they were able to control for those things. Um, but what we've come to is, is expanding those ideas to trauma generally. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, but that study really came out of a, the notion that they, uh, they wanted to control for it and see what they could um, draw connections to. And then that continues through a number of different areas. So we can see the higher the A score, the higher number of co-occurring problems, so health and social problems listed here. Um, and then also higher prevalence of adult stress. Um, so this slide shows that family or adults with three or more ACEs in their past um, are also more likely to experience adult stressors. And then they, they looked at major stress categories here. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to um, you, I think. If stuff. you could, sure. yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble right. doing both. Right. Um, uh, so homelessness, incarceration, chronic illness, things that are very stressful in adult life um, also can predict ability or disability across the month. So here you can see that folks who had more than three adverse childhood experiences um, who are also dealing with adult stressors which correlate to adverse childhood experiences. Then we're recording between 15 and 30 days of disability in a month. And I always use this slide because I'm talking with providers. I do medical legal partnership. Um, and one of the things that providers talk to me about a lot is failed appointments, right? No shows and failures. But if we're thinking about our patient clients as unable to engage in the activities of daily life for half or all of the month, how are they going to make that appointment, right? How are they going to get out of bed, get showered, travel, and arrive someplace? Um, so it's really just context as we think through these issues. Great. Um, and so we've extrapolated what we've learned from the Adverse Childhood Experiences <coughs> Survey to the broader idea of trauma. Expanded ACEs is one of the terms that we use. Um, and so we talk about historical trauma, um, which won't be a huge focus today. I'm going to mention it again, um, but it's something that I encourage you to think more about. Um, but of course, experiencing racism and bigotry and xenophobia, um, displacement, witnessing community violence, all of these things are different versions of trauma, right? They weren't in the original study, but we can certainly make the connection here. 
Um, and so when we talk about trauma, which is sort of where the, the science has gone more generally, um, there are a lot of different definitions out there. But this is one that a lot of folks are using today. And so we, we refer to it as the three E's. We talk about event, experience, and effect. right? Because you can experience an event that doesn't affect every day of the rest of your life. Um, but very often with trauma, we do see that effect running through people's lives. Um, toxic stress is another main concept in this area. Um, so not just a singular experience, but the repeated experience of traumatic events or a traumatic event that goes on and on. Um, so you can imagine, we talk about the classic example of the child welfare system, foster care, um, where someone doesn't have a protective adult or a protective factor in their life, and they're constantly hypervigilant, they're constantly on alert, they're constantly in fear. Um, that's an example of toxic stress. Um, and this is another way to look at it in terms of thinking uh, even earlier and sort of more broadly about historical trauma, community trauma, and how that can impact your clients. So when you're thinking about direct services, you're not just thinking, did my client experience something on the survey, right? You're really thinking holistically about assuming some trauma so that you're going to provide these services in a trauma-informed way, right? Which is going to benefit everyone. So just as a reminder, risk factors are not predictive because of protective factors, and we'll talk about some of those. Um, and we'll talk about providing services in a way that is protective, that provides a protective factor in your client's lives. Um, so classic symptoms in adults, and this is of course not exhaustive, right? Um, but anger and depression, unexplained, unexplained physical pain, right? So somatic complaints, um, high risk or impulsive behaviors, Inability to de-escalate, right? Have you ever had a client who's just so upset about something and there's no way you're going to have a productive conversation while they're in that state? And they may not come down from that in the next five minutes, right? That may be tomorrow. Um, substance and alcohol use can be a symptom of trauma. Um, aggression, self-harm, alienation, social withdrawal, isolation, avoidance of family and friends, all of these can be symptoms of trauma in adults. Uh, for kids, a child may be difficult to soothe um, or be hypervigilant, like I mentioned, chronically aroused at all times, ready to fight, flight, or sometimes freeze, which often is left off the list. Um, having nonspecific or generalized fears, um, a sense of a foreshortened future, right, saying, it doesn't matter if I go back to school, right, because there's nothing else coming after that. I had a client say that to me. Um, difficulty with peer relationships, impulsive behavior again, inability to recognize danger or consequences, right? So you would expect, for instance, a 14-year-old um, to recognize danger in certain situations, like even crossing the street. Um, but kids who've been through severe trauma sometimes can't connect that. Um, and the science is really interesting. It goes into the chronological disruption that happens. The if-then statements can be really difficult for, for folks who experience trauma. Um, so if I walk into the street against the light, I may get hit by a car. Those two concepts may not follow, right? It may not work chronologically in their brain, and so not able. they may not be able to recognize that danger. Um, and stranger anxiety or indiscriminate attachment, I see a lot with children. Um, so a, a four-year-old has never met me and immediately climbs into my lap and is like a little koala and they're never letting go, um, right? It's, it's endearing, um, but that should also be a flag. Um, okay. So resilience factors, though, are a very important part of all of this as well. Um, Resilience is the ability to recover. Um, so some kids will have experienced a trauma, but if they have a lot of protective factors in their life, they may not be impacted by it in the same way that another kid experiencing the same situation may react. Um, uh, also, having a positive or a consistent adult in your life is a really important protective factor. So when I'm thinking about IEPs, for instance, special education programs for kids who've been through trauma, I'm asking, who is the person in this school that you trust? And let's make sure that there's a, a regular connection to that person. Um, 
also all of you, when you provide direct services, are acting as one of those consistent adults. And so we'll talk about different ways to do that and why that's important. Um, and then even as adults, our brains are capable of learning and changing, right? Neuroplasticity, when we recognize these things, we can adapt and we can change. Um, and that's a really important part of talking about trauma in any context. Um, also, there are a, a slew of actual um, provider-based techniques, um, so healthcare can actually help folks deal with trauma. Um, dialectical behavior therapy, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, um, learning distress tolerance, so how to soothe oneself. As I work with teenagers um, on their special ed programs, saying what helps you come down? What do you need? Do you need someone to come put their arm around you or do you need someone to not touch you at all? Right? Having those kinds of conversations um, can make a difference for people on the daily life stuff. Um, EEG neurofeedback is also another that um, has shown some success. So I kind of tore through that. Do you have any questions for the moment before we start talking about practical tools? Yes? You seem to indicate the solutions would be some kind of service like psychotherapy of some kind or an EEG um, kind of device on feedback. Um, who pays for all of these kinds of wonderful services? Because it doesn't seem that you offered ideas that an individual could implement or could be implemented with an individual without um, hundreds or thousands of dollars in paid services. Um, well, I'm a legal aid attorney, so actually money never occurs to me as a possible <laughs> um, solution. I'm thinking Medicaid covered um, services in, in the ideal. I'm also, I work with youth, um, and so thinking about services in school is another important one. Um, the Children's Research Triangle here in Chicago provides excellent trauma-informed services. They have a wait list, but they do provide um, grant-funded free services to youth. Um, and of course, mental health services in, in Illinois, hard to come by, um, right? But that is the ideal, is trying to find some, some mechanisms for dealing with it. For adults? Well, there's mental health services for adults in Illinois, right? But it's, I know a trick and I know the wait lists are sort of endless. Um, uh, but I guess that's part of the challenge, right? Uh, so let's keep going if that's okay. Uh, so first, as we think about practical tools um, for being trauma-informed, we don't want to screen unless we're going to do something with that information, right? So if it's not central to the representation, there may not be a benefit to knowing the trauma of your client's past. Um, a lot of health providers have actually started screening for this because then they can start thinking about somatic complaints that may be connected to something else where there's no diagnosis and they've been working on something for ages without a solution. Um, but I think in the legal services we need to be very uh, cautious about when and why we're asking about people's trauma. Um, but it does give us a chance. We can be very flexible in how we provide these services. We can adapt our systems and design new ones that are trauma-informed. Um, and then the refrain in the trauma-informed community is you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. So we're going to talk about exactly how to do that. Um, so the aim is always not is to avoid re-traumatization. Um, and in my practice, we aim to mitigate the causes and consequences of trauma. Um, we do that with legal services. Um, so you want to think first about where is trauma in your representation? Is it central to your representation? Are you um, representing uh, domestic violence survivors where the trauma is part of the representation? Or are you doing eviction defense and trying to provide services that are trauma-informed but don't require you to delve into your client's trauma history? That's the first step. Um, so, again, you don't have to be therapist to be therapeutic. Uh, and here we go. So for, first, establishing safety. Um, considering the physical environment of your office is very important. Um, being, uh, thinking about your client's view, right? So we, we just set up at Legal Counsel for Health Justice um, our reception and our two client interview rooms and tried to be really trauma-informed. So we've got um, 
part of being trauma-informed for us was also trying to differentiate from uh, health provider exam rooms because our clients are always dealing with health issues, right? So we've got nice lighting, we've got plants, we've got shelves. You never see wooden shelves in an exam room, right? Um, so we really try to make it a welcoming environment. We've got a lot of art on the walls. Um, those kinds of things are important from the client's view. We make sure that rooms are lit so that you can tell if someone is in there, you can tell what's coming around the corner. We have um, transparent uh, client interview rooms, so there's, there's glass where you can see through, but there's transparent covering, so you have confidentiality. Right? All of these li different little measures can really help. Um, being non-judgmental is really important, so a classic phrase in trauma-informed practices is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Right? What has happened in your life that has brought you to this point? Um, continued assurance that information is confidential is really important for folks who've been through trauma. Um, so, for instance, I have a, a few clients where before I submit a release of information that they've already signed and we've already talked through releases, before I actually send it, I shoot her a text and I say, hey, remember the one about Lori? I'm sending that today. Right? Just an extra measure of saying, this is confidential. When I share your information, you're going to know about it, and I'm never going to do it without your consent. Um, which, of course, is just best practices in, in lawyering, um, but you can think about these things from this perspective and see where you might make changes in your practice. Um, previewing what will come is a really helpful tool for establishing safety. So saying, um, hey, Lynn, I have a couple things on the agenda. Here's what they are. What would you like to start with? Right? So never saying, hi, here's my, you know, not even saying here is my question, but asking the question before previewing what's going to happen. And partly that's because people need a lot of warning before you're going to ask about past trauma. Um, so if I talk to my client and every time I talk to her, I tell her what's coming, she knows that she's never going to get surprised by that question. Right? If I do need to talk to her about her trauma, I tell her, hey, next week, I'd like to ask you some questions about your trauma. We don't have to do it for very long, right? I'm previewing everything so that she knows what's coming. Um, being trustworthy. So being predictable and consistent, these are all things that you're already doing in your practice. Um, but if you think about them from this lens, you can be a little bit more intentional about them. Um, so saying, so I had a client text me this morning and she had a question and I texted her right back and I said, here's the answer. Also, I'm going to be giving a presentation and available again after 11, right, so that she knows exactly what um, I'm available for today. Um, but also establishing clear boundaries. So we just added at the end of our intake um, an, an explanation of our expectations around communication. So if you text me at 8 in the morning, I'm likely to respond. If you text me at 11 at night, I'm probably not around. Establishing those clear boundaries before there's a moment for you to fail, right? Um, folks who've been through trauma are frequently looking for the failures of the people they're working with. Um, how are you going to fail me? How's it going to look? Um, and are we going to be done when you failed me? Um, so part of being trustworthy when you fail is acknowledging it, right? If, I, if I'm in a client meeting that goes way too long and it bumped into my next client meeting, the first thing I'm saying is I'm really sorry that I didn't do a better job of scheduling, right? You have to acknowledge it in order to be a trustworthy ally. Um, being transparent about expectations around communication I mentioned. Um, not sugarcoating, right? That's another failure of trust. If you don't understand how important something is to me, then I don't believe that, you, that it's important to you as well, right? So not sugarcoating, never saying at least, right? At least you have your health. Well, that doesn't help what we're talking about. Um, and then finally, keeping promises and not over-promising. This is just a struggle in lawyering <laughs> um, and the helping professions, I think, but something to keep in mind. Um, providing choice. So I mentioned earlier when I call clients, I give them the agenda, I preview the agenda, and then I let them choose what we're going to talk about. So today we need to talk about the SNAP appeal and the next IEP meeting. What would you like to talk about first? What should we tackle first? Always providing choice on as many things as possible. 
not with the purpose of overwhelming and saying like every time we talk you're gonna have to make a huge decision um, but giving clients who've experienced trauma a little bit more autonomy and control over the situation um, laying out different paths to get to the same goal um, and of course recognizing that the goal may not be the same as the legal goal um, but giving that credence and starting with that and having conversations about the legal goal from the perspective of I know our priority is X and so here's what I think you can do here are the different options for getting to X um, never telling a client you have to right that removes all choice that removes all autonomy um, and then preserving uh, preserving choice even when someone is having a tough time so um, I had a a 14 year old who uh, was going through a whole lot, he was the client, um, he was an unaccompanied homeless youth, and and he just like threw his hands up and was like, I'm done, like don't come back, don't talk to me anymore, I'm done, and I said, sure, okay, I hear you, I know this is a tough time, um, let's have that conversation next week, and if that's the choice, then that's the choice, right, so preserving some of that choice, but also not letting not letting the client succumb to the stress of their trauma at the same time, right? So it's balance. Um, okay, being collaborative, right? So we frame every case as a partnership. You and I are going to work together on this. Um, asking open-ended questions is really important. So not, I think we, you know, it's very easy to get into our advocate brains um, and need this particular information and try to rush through and try to get someone to answer a specific question. Um, but we always try to start with open-ended questions and just letting the client, um, you know, letting the client talk. So maybe a bit of steering, but mostly we're really trying to um, let them be an active participant, and that means letting them talk without interrupting. Um, let's see. Um, so acknowledging the client's perspective, as I mentioned um, on the last slide as well, is part of being collaborative. So always grounding it always grounding our conversations in the client's priority because that's the only thing we're collaborating on right there may be other things that come into it but that's always the the root of what we're doing um, and then in terms of being collaborative one of the things that we don't want to do is put all of the um, all of the recitation of the trauma if it is central to your representation on the client so being collaborative can also mean I'd like to talk with your mental health provider so you don't have to tell me this whole story. Um, and I'm going to look at the records when I can so that we don't have to go through this every time because I know you've told this story a bunch of times already. Being collaborative can also mean looping in other people. And empowering. Um, so we, it's, I think, sometimes uh, difficult as attorneys to remember to celebrate the little things, especially when they're not legal. Right, so um, I'm trying to think of an example. I had a client turn in a reasonable accommodation request that was awesome. So that's a legal, <laughs> a legal success. She did a great job. Um, but taking the moment to say, "Oh, I'm so glad that you called me," right? We don't say that very often, but a lot of times that's a big deal for a client, especially in like the texting age, where it's uncomfortable to have voice-to-voice -voice conversations. Even um, so, starting with that. Um, this is another classic trauma-informed question. How have you done so well? Right? And that's not just a rhetorical question. Like, really, how have you done so well? What helped you get through this stuff? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it taking a little time at night after your kids go to bed? Those kinds of things can actually really improve your representation. Um, and then empowering the client for the future. So every time we go through um, you know, a SNAP application or a Medicaid application, we're going through it and saying, this is great, you could do this next time, right? You've done a great job of gathering the information you need. Those kinds of moments actually make a huge difference for clients. And I recognize that you know a lot of this stuff, right? We're just grounding it um, in, in these concepts. So we're going to do a quick role play, don't be afraid. <laughs> um, and uh, Truly quick, so we're going to read through it and then just sort of brainstorm quickly. Um, so whether you do eviction or not doesn't matter. Uh, but you have an intake scheduled with Bernard, a 68-year-old vet 
who, uh, for later this afternoon. He reports his landlord has verbally threatened to kick him out on the street, and the appointment was just mm -hmm. scheduled yesterday. But since then, the receptionist tells you he's called your office eight times, inquiring about different actions he should take in the meantime, so before your meeting this afternoon. Um, however, you were in court on another matter and have been unaware of the calls piling up, making Bernard really frustrated and angry. Uh, when you get out of court, you call him back, and he demands to see you immediately. He says if you don't see him now, his entire life will fall apart. So, um, we want to think about how to approach Bernard in a trauma-informed way, but also, um, you know, on your agenda is to make sure that you're going to meet later. Um, and so the goal here is really just to give him information to help him de-escalate, because it may take him from mm -hmm. now until your afternoon appointment to de-escalate, right? So giving him that chance. Um, so you're giving him the phone call, and in effect, in effect trying to help him de-escalate, because that's the first thing that he's focused on. Um, and then I'm going to tell him that's great that you are so dedicated to this. This kind of perseverance where you've called this many times means that you're really invested in your case, you're doing a great job, right? So I'm already starting with some empowerment and some affirmation, um, but then offering some transparency by promising to talk through all of his concerns and his options with his landlord this afternoon. So constantly focusing then on meeting this afternoon. Um, we would want to establish tr trust um, by reiterating, of course, that you care a lot about his case um, and maintaining his housing and that that's why you're going to meet today and it's on your calendar and you are prepped for that meeting and looking forward to it. Um, and then I may also, I do this with a lot of clients to, to try to give them some predictability. When you come to my building later, you're going to come into the lobby and there's a doorman at the desk and some flowers there and then some elevators. Like describing details of what he's going to see or experience when he comes um, so that he knows when he walks into that building what's going to happen. Um, so trying to take all of those things and distill that into this conversation. This is not the time to say, you can't call my office eight times, right? This is not the time to correct any kind of behavior. You can do that later when he's de-escalated and he's calm and you're in your office. Um, but really just trying to uh, take a moment for yourself, too, and realize that you may be frustrated and a little bit annoyed because you are a human as well. Um, but not letting that come into a phone call. Um, oh, and then finally, he says, if you don't see him now, his entire life is going to fall apart. Right? It's not, <clears throat> that's not something to address in this call either. Um, and, and generally not something you can address at all. I think, I mean, we, we're lucky because we're in partnership with mental health providers, and I really like to try to not be, you can be therapeutic without being a therapist, but don't try to be a therapist, right? Um, so not validating it or invalidating it, just not addressing that issue in this call. Uh, so do we have questions? Do you want to discuss anything about these practical tools? Well, so I have a question. So mm -hmm. if he's saying on the phone call when you're returning his call, I really need to see you. My entire life is falling apart if you don't see me right away. Mm -hmm. So do you ignore that because you said not to... Well, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna engage on the life falling apart section of it. I would say we have four hours until we meet. Your landlord isn't gonna make any new moves in those next four hours. Um, we're gonna come up with a plan when we meet. Those kinds of things. Where I'm not gonna go down the path of whether his life is falling apart or not. I will validate the stress that he's under. I'll say I know this is so stressful when you're housing seems uncertain, but I've done this a bunch of times and the landlord can't do anything in the next four hours. This is what you have me for, we're going to work on this together, those kinds of things. So it's sort of separating out what I'll engage in. So what would you say if he had fled in a suicide instead? Yeah, so we've had this come up um, a bunch of times and we, so we're putting together uh, like a suicide prevention protocol. Um, we have some sort of minimal training. Um, when we engage with clients, because we're lucky to have a mental health partner, we actually say right off the bat, 
um, if you're thinking about hurting yourself or hurting someone else, then we don't have any duty of confidentiality and we really feel that we have to report that. Is it okay if I ask you right now, is it okay to connect with your mental health provider in the event that things get that bad? Um, so we're, we're trying to stave off some of that at the beginning, at least in terms of confidentiality and who we can call. Um, and then we have sort of the basic suicide protocol of first questions. Um, and then we have the hotlines and the texting and the online chat and things like that. Uh, but that's a tough situation. I think every organization has to come up with their own sort of methods on that. I, mean, I think just following up on that, I think a lot of times when you say something like, you know, I'm taking you seriously and I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, connect you with a suicide hotline for somebody who's trained to do this, I'm a yeah. lawyer, I'm not trained to do that, oftentimes that might be a situation, okay, well, we'll deal with that later, you know what I mean? It, it's yeah. not that you're calling the bluff, but you're, by taking it seriously, sometimes they use that as a manipul manip manipulative tool, right. so. Right. Yeah, um, the only other thing I was going to ask is, um, you know, one of the things he, he was really upset that you didn't call him. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it makes sense to say, yeah, I want to let you know I wasn't ignoring your call that you had. I was in court helping another client or right. something like that. So it yes. shows that it's, you know, you're not just, you had other things going on right. and you have more than one client um, you know, in the mix. Absolutely. That's part of the transparency. That's part of the trustworthiness to say I wasn't ignoring you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So should we move on to secondary trauma? Um, so this is, you know, everything that we know about trauma um, and its impact on our health, of course, applies to those of us in the helping professions where we're hearing some pretty tough stories on a regular basis and taking those home with us. Um, can you skip to the next one? Um, so just a couple of definitions to ground ourselves with. Um, secondary traumatic stress is the presence of PTSD symptoms. So the DSM-5 PTSD is like a pretty set um, uh, pronged test, um, whereas vicarious trauma is a little bit looser, um, and we think about that as referring to the inner experience of the helper um, resulting from empathic engagement. So when you're burned out and when you're taking this stuff home, it's always useful to remember that that's because you're actually empathizing with your client. Um, so part of doing this work means that we're exposed to this. Um, let's go on. So, um, organizationally, resisting vicarious trauma. Um, thinking about how you can adjust your systems, thinking about these boundaries with clients, right? Where um, we just added the communication expectation to our intake so that every time we're talking to a client, we're already telling Bernard at the beginning of representation or, or even intake before representation. Um, if you call eight times, we're not likely to be able to get back to you just because you've called a lot. But we always try to get back to people within 24 hours. The texting, those kinds of things, setting those things out um, needs to be an intentional part. Um, celebrating the small successes we mentioned in terms of direct services, but we should also think about those in terms of our actual organization. Um, how often do you go into like case acceptance and you only talk about terrible things and then it's over? Um, but maybe that's a moment to start with someone's win, right? Even if it's a small win, right? It doesn't have to be like a huge overpayment that you got taken care of for Social Security, um, but something that you can share or something that you can um, maybe, maybe not the person who did it, but someone else who knows that it happened, bringing that to the table. Um, and then not sharing traumatic stories and details unless it's necessary. I think this is something that we can we really go off the cliff with um, in legal aid. Oh my God, listen to this, right? My client just had this horrible, horrible thing happen. Um, we've started, especially the, the folks that are really trauma-informed at legal counsel, um, we just don't share details, right? Unless it's necessary to the representation or the, the strategy that you're discussing, um, we don't need to hear what the abuse was, right? We don't need to hear um, what happened in that DV situation. Um, so you can you can be a little bit more conservative about sharing. Um, of course, disconnecting from email. I mean, we all have an ethical obligation to our clients. It's a little bit impossible to just um, step away. But thinking about moments where you can and thinking about reserving times for that is really important. Um, using a lot of vacation and sick days. I mean, some, a lot of this is obvious, right? It's very obvious. Um, 
but maybe being more intentional about when you use them and how you use them um, can help. And then organization-wide trauma trainings. Um, so you're all here, um, but are you the only one from your organization who's here? Are people at your organization going to recognize that maybe they shouldn't spread the trauma of their case to you? Are you going to recognize that a client, a, a colleague who's maybe not having the greatest reaction to a request, maybe is dealing with their own stuff, right? When you bring in organization-wide trauma trainings, those kinds of things get better. Um, and then also health insurance and having behavioral health as part of the health insurance is really important. Uh, we can talk about it in, yes. Um, can I just ask a question? So, you know, um, sharing traumatic stories or details, doesn't it help people who are working in the field to share it with their colleagues? I mean, that's... Well, I think it's, I think it's individual. Um, I have a couple of friends who are not legal aid attorneys, and I talk more freely with them because they can handle it. And I had a best friend call me and be like, I can handle your traumatic stories. Um, but the folks at, at legal counsel, like, I, I often don't want to share with them. So I think it's individual. I think if you have a buddy where it's reciprocal and you're both okay with it. Um, but I think where it becomes a problem is when I'm dealing with a bunch of really tough cases and then my colleague comes and unloads on me and I'm not ready for it. And I don't think I can say that to her, right? Because she needs it. But then I end up in a worse off position mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so that's where I think being careful about when and how you do it is important. Um, so it, it's going to be case by case, of course. Um, but if you're comfortable with it or you want to invite someone to talk about it, then maybe that's the, the invitation instead of just doing it without any warning. Something to think about. These yeah, are, no, it's good to think these about. These are points of advice, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> and a lot of times, I mean, these them. discussions also can happen in a large group meeting, like your case acceptance meeting is a kind right. of a typical place where you would share that kind of thing. And that's sort of sharing it with the masses almost, you know, right. like 10 people. So maybe if you have that one-on-one, -on -one, that's a way to get it out. But without, I don't know, I never really thought about that as people were dumping trauma on me, but I, you know, I see what you're right. saying. So. Yeah. Well, and, and we see it where, like, everyone at the table has some kind of horrific story for their client, right? Everybody's leaving that meeting feeling a little depleted, I think. Um, and so maybe you're not noticing it if it's not too much, but of course it adds up over time. Um, also, get a therapist. Right? <laughs> Talk to that person. They're paid to listen. Um, um, but also, I think the supervision um, relationship is probably a, a good place for that, where maybe at CAM you don't need to do it, but in your supervisory relationship. Um, so I supervise two really fantastic legal advocates. And when we sit down for our weekly meeting, the first question is, how are you doing? Are you holding up? How are the cases this week? Because it seems like sometimes we just get waves of horror. Um, and it's not spread out. <laughs> like, couldn't you spread it out a little? No. Um, and so checking in on those things. And then maybe you redistribute, right? So when one of them has, for some reason, lots of really tough cases, and a new tough case comes in, I'm going to assign it to the other one, right? Um, actually, there's an agency in Chicago, amazing. They, um, they saw a real uptick in really traumatic cases, and they started um, bifurcating the cases so that one attorney was the client-facing person and just dealt with all of the trauma, and a different attorney, attorney was in charge of the brief writing and the deadlines and all of the non-client-based uh, stuff, and then switch for other cases. Obviously, that's not possible everywhere. Um, but the idea of sort of alleviating some of it when you see it is great. Um, and then I think part of being a supervisor is modeling those methods of self-care and, and really showing that. So I'm still writing emails at midnight, but I'm trying to just leave them as drafts <laughs> and sending them in the morning, right? Because there's some implicit stress in receiving an email from your boss that they sent at 12.30 at night. Right, and feeling like, damn, I wasn't looking at email. Um, so just put in your draft, send everything at 9 a.m. Everyone's going to be like, wow, I was her 9 a.m. priority. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think for supervisees, right, we have to manage up. 
Um, we have to think about this in terms of self-care um, and not be ashamed of it and not be ashamed to ask for some help. So like if everything is really too much, maybe you need a sick day or maybe you need to suspend intake, right? Those are pretty drastic. Um, but maybe you can talk to your supervisor about certain cases that you're really having trouble with. Um, my supervisor said to me, she was like, wow, Sarah, DCFS really messes with you. And that was a moment when I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I deal with all kinds of cases, but the DCFS cases, for some reason, really, like, are a knife to the heart for me. So now we're a little bit more careful about when and how I get involved in those and whether maybe it's a better referral. Um, so lots of ways to think about it. Certainly long-term career goals, like thinking about are direct services meant for you? Um, and if they are, and this is just still really hard for you, what are the long-term mechanisms that you can put in place to sort of protect yourself? Also get a therapist. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, some methods for self-care. Again, self-care stuff is always kind of obvious, but I think we're not intentional enough about it sometimes. Um, and so one thing that's really helpful is de-traumatizing with a similar group. So I work with kids with uh, chronic health issues, um, but I was a ballet dancer first, and so I teach ballet. I just sub. It's not like a weekly thing, but I substitute teach, and I hang out with a bunch of kids where we're not talking about their health issues, right? We're talking about plies and fondues, and there's a different focus. Um, <laughs> Because part of what happens when we work with populations that struggle is then we start to think that everyone struggles like that. Um, I will say an example, but I, um, I volunteered in an orphanage in Guatemala for a long time. And by the end of my time there, I saw a family, like a nuclear family with a mom and a dad and two kids. And it was like, I couldn't process it, my brain forgot that that existed, forgot that that was a thing. Um, and so sometimes, like, even now, my friends are having babies, and I'm like, you can't have a healthy baby. Like, why, you know, oh my gosh. Um, and I realized that that's, that's just my fatigue, right? That's, that's me taking it home every day. Um, so think about that in your own context. How do you hang out with people? How do you spend your time in a way that's going to remind your brain that it's not trauma all the time? Um, and that's like, you know, Netflix, right, or the shows you watch, or the documentaries you watch, or the plays you go to. Um, if you notice, like, through this entire slide, every photo is meant to de-bias you. Every photo is meant to remind you that people succeed and are fantastic and are listened to. Um, so doing that around your office can be helpful. Um, those are just classic de-biasing techniques, but I think it also works um, with fatigue with work fatigue and um, sympathy fatigue. So meditation, exercise, therapy, um, nutrition, sleep, all of these things are the obvious ones, but are you being intentional, right? Are you putting your pajamas on at 10 so that you can actually go to bed? Um, are you zoning out at the TV for a bunch of hours every night because you need to get away from work? Is that actually helping you decompress, or are you just avoiding it? Would it be better for you to go for a walk? Those kinds of evaluations are helpful. Um, and then finally, nurturing yourself. And I put this here because one of the things that we do, you know, the helping professions and, and law attracts a lot of type A, uh, you know, overachievers, right? Um, and so. I had this attitude like, I'm going to self-care, like, <laughs> so well. <laughs> um, and I had a, a physician friend who was like, that's not nurturing. You're stressing yourself out about not being in bed early enough. Like, chill out. Um, so really evaluating your self-care methods from a point of, is this helping you? Do you feel good about it? Um, rather than, like, are you achieving your self-care, right, which is a different question. Um, so this is food for thought, right? It's um, that's why it's a professional responsibility category. It's not a uh, substantive law. So think creatively about different ways that you can adapt this to your practice. Um, we still have a few minutes, which I'd love to um, hear different thoughts you have, or questions, or discussion. How relevant is uh, or uh, this is a tricky issue, but people who are um, doing this work who've had trauma themselves. 
you know, sort of the empathy, like, I get it, I've, you know, been there, or mm-hmm. that, is that something that makes sense to do, or is that a, a sort of a, a wall? Yeah, yeah, I think that's an individual decision, because I've heard it advised both ways. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to be able to disconnect from work, you need to not put your personal life on the table. Um, but I've seen people who empathize by sharing, and I think it's totally, I mean, that's part of your self-care, too. Like, is it going to, are you going to be able to survive direct services if you're sharing like that? Or is it is it helpful to you? Mm-hmm. Do you have a better relationship with your client and it doesn't re-traumatize you? Um, certainly you don't want to be sharing traumatic stories in a way that's going to re-traumatize your client right. either. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really individual. I think another way you can think about that is sort of how are you presenting yourself outside of your words? So... Do you have um, photos of your entire family on your office wall or where you meet with your clients when maybe what they're struggling with is their family falling apart or the death of a loved one, right? So thinking about how you can cue being welcoming um, without also triggering your clients. I think, though, you know, um, Can you speak up a little, Laura? Oh, sorry. If you do share... um, I do think you have to be careful not to sort of project your own response onto that person, your response to trauma. So I have like observed people, um, most people who work here have heard this story, but you know, where people who um, are sort of trying to, you know, empathize, but at the same time they're saying, but I really handled this very well. And so then the client is sort of like, oh, gee, right. you know, I must be deficient because I didn't handle it the way the lawyer handled it or the expert handled it. So I think I think it's tricky. Yeah, that's a know. great point. Right. Because then you're you're implicitly adding some judgment to how right. they're going through it. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, trucked my way through it and you should be able to do it without right. saying that. Well, and, and part of that is just empathy, right? Being able to empathize with someone without telling them what to do or how to do it or at least, right, without silver linings it. Um, so saying, man, that is so tough. Or maybe you can say, man, that is so tough and I've been there and I know and stop there. <laughs> yeah. Right, so we have, I mean, we have employees with disabilities who've obviously faced barriers in their lives. We have employees who have you know, kids with disabilities who you know, or working with people who have kids with disabilities. So, I, mean, I think there's sort of a natural thing, but I think it's, like you said, it can be sort of a tricky area to navigate. Right. And you don't want to take the focus too much off of the client either, of right? You're there to collaborate on their issue. Yeah. Um, do you all have any ideas about, organizationally, how you might make changes that are to be a bit more trauma-informed? Um, and you can think about sort of through the process, like from outreach to intake, to representation or follow-up, follow-ups, and we don't do a lot of in legal services. So how did you guys get that going at your organization? It's an area that I'm interested in learning more about and how we can do it here. Um, So there are several folks at Legal Counsel who are trauma-informed. or who are like really nerdy about it, right? Everyone everyone would like to be trauma-informed. Um, so Lisa Parsons directs the SSI Homeless Outreach Project, um, and it's mostly disability, SSI disability um, representation for adults experiencing homelessness with co-occurring substance use and mental health issues. Um, and she's, she's rooted her briefs in trauma um, and the scholarship around trauma. Um, and trauma is central to her argument. So a client who's struggling with substance use, Social Security would love to say, um, you know, they are not eligible. Um, but she can root the substance use as a symptom of childhood and adult trauma. Um, and so it's central to her argument. Um, and so she's, you know, very passionate about it. Um, and then we've got um, also a legal advocate who's also also a social worker who's really dedicated to it. Um, and then we have a project at Under the Rainbow, um, which is Mount Sinai's Outpatient Children's Behavioral Health Clinic. Um, and so her practice is entirely focused on trauma. It's very often um, DCFS involvement or child custody issues, um, abuse and neglect. 
Uh, and so that's a core. That's enough, right? And like classic organizing, you and two other people can do anything. That's so that one person can quit. Um, so a little core. Um, and then mostly I just kept like presenting um, literature on how to make the space trauma informed. So it's little, you know, it's partly volunteering. <laughs> Um, but I think these these trainings can make a difference just to start, and I think a lot of people need to hear the trauma science more than once before they start to accept it or recognize it. Um, but talking about some of these symptoms, because when we went through the symptoms, you've all had clients, right, who have those symptoms. Um, so maybe that's a way to start getting people to flag and recognize um, trauma. I think there are a number of different ways to do it. So when you talk about the legal brief, mm -hmm. when she's doing that, is that based on sort of, you know, just what she understands, or is that like getting an expert to link the two? Right. Yeah. It no, seems she's, like you would need... she's citing to the scholarship. Yeah. Certainly. But I mean, um, is it an expert for that particular person, or is she just saying typically if somebody has substance abuse, they had? Right. So, um, so she's using the trauma scholarship and then connecting it to the medical record usually. Right. So she's. And, and she's she's extrapolating in, in many of those situations because a lot of um, mental health providers, for instance, won't say avoidance, right? They won't just hit the nail on the head, um, but will demonstrate avoidance or isolation through the medical record, hasn't talked to family in 11 years, hasn't talked to friends, you know, those kinds of things. So you're, you're making the connection. Um, I don't think she's brought in an expert. So there's not an individual analysis that establishes a correlation between the two events. Is that correct? Well, she's drawing that in the brief, in general. Yes, but it's an association, not a correlation, correct? Well, are you trying to correlate the adverse child experience or the trauma to the symptom? Is that yes, your question? Because someone <clears throat> sustained this experience that has led, that has caused X. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think there are a number of ways to do that. I mean, I've read briefs where the client said that, right? The client said, I have to drink because otherwise I'm just going to, you know, they're not going to use this word, I'm just going to perseverate on my experience of X. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways through the record to establish that and being creative, right? I mean, these are sort of new arguments, um, but she wins lots of cases. <laughs> You mentioned a few times that you communicate with your clients via text. Yes. And I just wondered if you can, um, that's something that I don't do and mm -hmm. I haven't done, and um, how you came to that decision and if that's yeah. working for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, if other people do that. Um, it's I'm just central. I'm to, okay. Yeah, it's totally central to what we do. Um, we, the way that um, the Medical Legal Partnership I'm a part of works is we serve all of Cook County. So folks are really far away, too, so we're doing a lot of phone intake. Um, rather than meeting with people, um, although we meet with a lot of people at their medical provider, we'll actually go to the doctor's office. Um, and so, but yeah, texting in this day and age, right, is how a lot of people, especially young people, communicate, and we focus on a zero to 26 year old population. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have actual anxiety about speaking on a phone. Um, there's a bunch of like studies around this mm -hmm. recently. Um, so. Also self-care, so I'm never sharing my actual cell phone number. It's your work um, number. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I keep hearing about people texting with clients from their phone. I'm like, no, no, that's not the recommendation. Um, so we have a, a system called Mobile Link, which forwards our, um, our work phone calls to our cell phone, and from which we can call and have our work number appear on the client's cell phone. That's, I've noticed, a, a big deal, too, is clients aren't going to answer an unknown number mm -hmm. very often. Um, and then we use Google Voice to text. Um, and so you get a phone number from that. And then I put that text number on all of my business cards so that people have that. There's, um, there's another system we're testing right now that uses your work number so that a person can text your work number. Um, I don't know how it works yet, but we're getting that. Um, but I find it to be hugely useful. Um, we even use it for taking photos and documents, and then they'll text me the photo of the document so I can say, oh, you have a Section 8 voucher, not, <laughs> not what you told me, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and we've even taken to doing releases of information and 
mailing them, and then they sign the paper, and then if they take a good flat photo of the paper, we can print that um, and use that. That's been really helpful. There are a couple of issues that, just so I can build on that, on texting that, because um, mm -hmm. we've talked about that a little bit internally, that I guess there have been some studies on legal aid and, and texting is, uh, one is um, to ensure that the texts get into the actual file, mm -hmm. and yes. maybe your system has that already. I, I mean, I don't Yeah, think. Google Voice is going to my email as well, so okay. each text So that we message. can drag that into the yeah. electronic file yeah, screen. And then the other issue is um, just the confidentiality. So who yeah. else has access to your phone? and with, right. you know, are your kids on your phone playing games and seeing right. all this information about, you know, yeah. somebody's client and, and either, you know, transferring it, deleting it, or just having rules of no access or whatever that might be, so. Yeah, yeah, very important. Um, and what did you say, um, two things, so uh, the first one is, um, we do have to have clients sign authorization for them. There's an app at your phone where they can sign in and put that yeah. Is it electronically, it because, yeah, they yeah. sign now, but there's a few different words for you. So if they're green, because then people don't have to worry about either the way you have to out the form and yeah. setting, and um, it is um, the agent. Um, yeah, yeah sign is the only one them. I know, but yeah, very helpful. Yeah, it so really, really helps with that. Um, um, I would need to ask you about them. Um, I have a client who goes into a lot of this. Um, Trauma, if you like doing publicity covers sometimes, mm -hmm. but I think that one of the um, COVID me mechanisms is to be equally and who are as healthy or easy a part of without the other people. And I yeah. don't take a person to the other's but mm -hmm. it's a challenge to try to be who I have because I show that I'm on your side. Yeah. Um, do you have yeah. any suggestions? Um, uh, and I, in some of the deep that I had shared with her, that she needs to do herself. Of the really specific, specific timeline, specific communication, and yeah. I get pushback. So you talked about options with these situations. This is pretty yeah. much the option you need to do within yeah. this specific time frame. Right. So um, what do you so do? So I struggle with that. <laughs> um, one of the, and we talk about that when we're having those kinds of challenges. That's either a supervisor conversation or my team and our supervisor. Um, and sometimes when people are really struggling with mental health, particularly, they may not be ready to do the kind of work that's necessary for a case. Um, and so we, we're always presenting errorless return, right? So if you'd like a reasonable accommodation, CHA needs to receive the form by this day. They're not going to give you extra days, right? So previewing what will happen if they do and if they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and then when that doesn't happen, we say, I know you're going through a lot. Um, what made it hard to get that form in? So not why didn't you do it, right, but changing to passive voice and saying, what made it too hard to get that in? And seeing if we can troubleshoot around that and stay involved. Um, but if we get to a point where we just can't make a case, um, then saying, here are the steps that you need to take in order to get what you want, and we're happy for you to come back anytime, and we'll help you, but the first thing that has to happen is you have to get this form, or you have to do that, and I, but it, I, that's the hardest thing, I think. Yeah, and then what do you do when they the need the result to at least the ethics to try and get it to me, I think is the client is trying to get a reaction from me, engage, and not going to engage, and yeah. be professional. Yeah. But is, is, it does not make it easy to be an advocate no. for this person. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have the perfect answer. Um, we always ask, like, or I always ask myself if I'm trying to fix a problem I can't fix. Um, and or I'll talk to the mental health folks. Um, so, you know, we're lucky in that sense. And I'll say, hey, I need to talk to you about X, she's telling me this, the record is showing this, how do I get to the same point? And part of what we'll do, so at Check, we're community health workers, mental health workers, and then the legal team, and so we'll get that person's mental health worker and the community health worker and me, and we'll have a meeting first, and then we'll have a phone call so that the client knows that she's gonna get the same answer from each person. Because um, sometimes 
like Barry, you mentioned, there's, you know, there's a fair amount of man manipulation, which is an adaptive behavior, right. right? People have learned to do that because they've had a hard time <clears throat> getting what they need. Um, so recognizing also that that's, it's not maladaptive, right? It's not bad. It's just what their body and their brain have taught them they need to do. Um, and then trying to get everyone on the same page. But I do think there's a balance between, you know, taking it and, and protecting yourself, too. I mean, I think if the person's being abusive, you can, you, you know, there's lines and say, whether it's in the terms that it sounds like you're not able to, you know, uh, you're having a tough day, maybe we need to talk another time or something like that, or, you know, saying there's certain things that are, I don't know, it seems like I would be able to say that uh, certain things that aren't acceptable, you can't cuss at me, or, you know, or something like that, and just have clear rules as a basis for the representation, and, um, I don't know, maybe you, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I just think there's, you know, we have to take care of ourselves in this part and, um, you know, having some boundaries, and you talked about boundaries before, I think are, are really critical. And maybe it's, you know, just a, a delay in engaging with them when they're in a better place, and sometimes it's like, you know, it's all or nothing. If you can't really do this, we're not going to be able to represent you. Mm -hmm. And I think saying in that moment, I know you're really upset but this doesn't work when I get yelled at or cursed at. So let's talk again not tomorrow or next week, right, and saying, I'm not throwing you away. I'm passing the push away test by giving you another chance, but the chance is not now, yeah. right? Because we can't, I mean, you just can't, and you can't be in danger, right? right? You, you can't put your safety at risk. So I do um, a lot of intake, and it's often difficult to, I think, sort of a balancing test for me to kind of figure out, um, as someone is divulging a lot and you're giving them the personal space and allowing the venting and, and what they need to do, when you're hearing parts of what they're saying and you think, my gosh, this is an awful story, but we probably won't be able to help you. Not because we don't care, but because this is something we don't know what, how, yeah. how to handle it and everything like that. So I think I kind of balance, or I, I struggle to balance how am I transparent and upfront in terms of managing the expectations so they don't think um, necessarily that we can help, but also so that I don't want us to be another resource that they've told their story to exactly. and they feel like it's just ignored. Right. So do you have suggestions for, and, and I sort of try to triage it. If someone's crying and, you know, having a very difficult time, I don't think that's the appropriate time to say, well, we might not be able to help you. But if someone seems to be talking about it, perhaps um, maybe more rationally or clear-headed, mm -hmm. I sort of give them that upfront, you know, I, I really want to help you, and part of helping you is directing you to resources that might be able to help you better than we can. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a struggle. It's something we, we work on a lot. Um, the nature of our partnership probably gives us an opportunity that maybe if you're doing like cold calls, are you doing cold call intakes, essentially? Uh, they're, they're calling us, yeah. yeah. Have a voice now. So you don't have any preview, you have no warning about what the issue is? Sometimes we have a little and sometimes it's consistent with that, other times it takes a whole other right. direction. Then, yeah, right, right yeah. Yeah. it's a totally different issue. Yeah. Um, well, one thing we've been trying to do is not go through the entire intake process if we know that there's an issue we can't handle. So like we said, we're not going to do med mail, right. you know, um, child support and child custody, we don't have the bandwidth for, but we've created a document of instructions and sort of helpful hints and resources. Um, so when we have those cases, uh, we say right away and we try not to collect information because we don't want to re-traumatize, because we don't want people to have to tell a story 18 times, right? Your clients hate it when they've told the same story a ton of times and then you tell them to tell it again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's tough. Um, maybe some kind of upfront screening um, before you delve into mm -hmm. everything could be helpful. Um, I don't know, are there other ideas around the table? I mean, I'm, I'm still learning all this stuff too and thinking about organizations. And then Megan's call here. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I do, and I do a lot of abuse in the class. Speak up a little, Leslie. I do a lot of abuse and neglect and exploitation here. And so, and a lot of people who have um, have diagnosed with mental illness. So it isn't always possible to do it this way because th this isn't how the person communicates. But sometimes when you're on the phone calling somebody back for an intake, they immediately start spilling everything out. And, and, and if I can, I say, just stop, 
for a minute and, and we'll get to that, but I don't want you to have to share personal information. I want to first kind of jump to the end of what your request is so I can make sure it's something that might fall into something we can help with yeah. before I start collecting a lot of really private information about you. Not everyone is capable of doing that because some people need to tell things in the order they need to and a lot of times they will tell you that. But a lot of times they will say, okay, well, what I want is this. And then I know, okay, that is something we could potentially have with, so let's, let's keep going. Yeah. But if they say it's MedMal or something like say, well, I know that that's something, um, you know, based on what you're describing, we're unlikely to, so I, I'm going to get some more limited information to make sure, but not yeah. have them spill their whole story so they feel exposed. But um, once you're past intake, um, your example, or I mean, um, some, when, when you have a client, our existing client, and you know, they leave a lot of messages, what I have found helpful is to tell them. When you leave a lot of messages, it, it will never be the case that I'm sitting there watching you call. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. um, and ignoring your calls. Um, if I am not calling you back immediately, it is because I'm not able to. Either right. I'm away in court, or I'm dealing with one of my other um, cases that are that are important in yours is too. Um, and if they're saying, you know, but I want to talk to you two hours early, I find it helpful to say, I've cleared my schedule for you because it's that important so I can give you my undivided attention and I'm not able to give you my undivided attention right now. But for one particular client, I think um, sometimes people are calling and calling because now they're, it's kind of like, I don't know, like swingers. You know, they leave the message and they're worried about how it sounded. So they're escalating things, you know? I mean, it's not exactly, but you know what I mean? They're like, oh no, I need to call back and fix that, but they're worried. Um, I had one client who kept, um, she wasn't like this, but, but kept saying, um, she became more and more insulting in like the 10 messages. And then when we talked, I discovered it was, she thought, because she had been really rude in one message, she thought I was going to sabotage her case. So I, you know, once you explain, there, even though what you said, was not appropriate, there's nothing you could ever say, even if you, you know, that, um, I didn't actually give her an example, I was thinking, uh, even if you said this, but right. you know, right. there's nothing you could ever say that would ever make you sabotage your case, and it would never be okay for any lawyer to sabotage your case, yeah. um, and, and that, that helps, but, so those that are some sounded things very that I to <laughs> <laughs> ideas is that I notice people often refer people on, um, like, uh, you know, um, people from the community on to other service providers or other organizations who they know very little about. And um, I know that because I get a lot of people who actually have a civil case um, and we handle criminal cases only. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so part of it is understanding, you know, is there what, what the situation is, is it, can, can it be handled legally, I work, and, and is it of a criminal nature? Um, and, and sort of like with you, part of it is, one, helping people, part of it is actually helping people understand what we do and what part of the process you're actually in. So, um, um, so that, that could be useful, is because people may be talking to you who have no idea whatsoever of what your organization does. Um, and and so that could be useful, as well as getting a sense of the basic, not necessarily their story, but their overall generic issue that they have that, that led to them to feel that they had a need for some kind of a resolution. So um, so that would be the other, as as Lauren mentioned, some something to not go to all the way to the end to think about. Um, to discuss the kind of um, issue a little bit in more global terms to know is that a category um, your organization actually mm -hmm. this with. Yeah. Um, oh, slide or not. <laughs> oh, this is just because you have the copy of the PowerPoint, so I wanted you to have some resources to start from. Um, and I do, I really recommend the Paper Tigers. It's an excellent documentary. It takes you, it's like the easy version of the science. Um, but it's got some great graphics that sort of explain more of the epigenetic um, elements of this. So um, when people are experiencing um, particular trauma, imagine 
right? You're being chased by a bear. Your adrenaline kicks in. Your cortisol shoots up. You're able to run faster than you've ever run or fight harder than you've ever fought. Or you, like, totally freeze and fall over and play dead. Um, those experiences, when they're happening um, without end or more frequently than, than the human body is used to, that upsurge of cortisol can really have an impact on your biochemistry. Um, and the, the best analogy I've heard is that it's not changing your genes. Um, it's changing which genes are expressed. So it's a little bit like a librarian telling you what to read. Um, and so certain genes are going to be expressed more prominently when a kid has been through lots of trauma or toxic stress. Um, and that can be passed intergenerationally. So there's some good videos out there. Paper Tigers is one of them um, on the ramifications of the epigenetics. Um, what else? And then Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, is eminently readable. It's a very, very good uh, book on the, the sort of process of the science. It goes back to Darwin. <laughs> um, but it's very interesting. Um, and then from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and the Near at Home Toolkit um, are some great resources to start with. Um, is there anything else? What's a good resource if um, you want to have trauma-informed care, like in the workplace? So as a supervisor, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of our own, which of those resources would be a good? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Actually, probably the, the near at home, which comes through the ACE interface. Laura Porter um, is a fantastic um, ACEs researcher. Um, also YouTubing some of her talks. Um, a lot of her full talks are on YouTube. and That's what I do in my off time. Um, <laughs> she is very, very good, though, um, and practical, and has a lot of ways of thinking about it that I think you can apply to your daily life. Um, and what was I going to mention? Oh, and the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative um, is one of the groups I mentioned. There's Illinois Childhood Traumatic, oh, Illinois Childhood Trauma Coalition. There it is. Um, uh, and then the Lurie Childhood uh, Center on Resilience. All of those have really great talks. Um, and I think that's one of the best ways that I've sort of recognized how I can incorporate this, this information. Um, is hearing people stand and talk and sort of talk through organizational issues or things like that. Um, the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative is having a full day event of lectures um, on, on uh, October 24th. So if you're interested, um, maybe just email me. My email is on your handout, um, and I can yeah. get you that in. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Sarah? And thanks for the conversation. I mean, you can tell this is really something that it, it's worth discussing, and it, that's where you get a lot of your ideas. So. Right. Well, Thank thanks you very all. much. Yeah.